ready. Only when he's ready, he begins. Mounds of stone, brick, iron, and cement sprouted from the ground, from the core of the earth, and grew into God's towers so large they could block up the sun, the moon, or any uh, any other thing on any given day. Gods of industry, combustion engines, alternative fuel, four-wheel power drive, pure Americana. We even create our own sound, born from the depths of our belly, released with a blues, a jazz, a funk. Softly, a cast can be heard in the wings, singing joyously, like a hymn, like Motown. Their voices sounding like chameleons. He listens, moves. <coughs> it became our anthem, our cry. Thousands descended to work, to live in the city. 1.6 million, with some change, to be exact. It was a time of high culture, economic gain, enlightenment. But like the Roman and British empires, we fell. Crumbled under our own weight, our own arrogance. What's left? Ruins. Fragments of memories and dreams to those who lived it. History to those who came after. A culture. A people fighting to regain what once was. It's strange how we always strive for what we were, rather than pushing towards something new, something that will survive. A hooded figure enters with a boombox, music blasting a dirty rap song. We can't see their face. The figure pulls a can of spray paint and begins their art on the back wall. For those who ain't paid yet, for those who ain't paid yet, this shit ain't free. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware, but this, is a, this city's bankrupt, so work isn't easy to come by, and the brother's trying to get to college. So pay up for a safe and proper tour of Cork Town. Some ground rules. I know I'm young, but you gotta follow my instructions. This is my hood, my place. I know how it works. How it does it. Good evening. Um, I'm Jeanette Farr Harkins. I'm the National Playwriting Program Chair and your hostess for this evening of the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. It is my great pleasure to introduce these dynamic new plays for you. Um, we have an evening of 10-minute plays, additional excerpts from the play that you just saw, uh, entitled Corktown or Through the Valley of Dry Bones by Jeff Augustin. Um, really some fantastic stuff by the renowned directors and actors of Washington, D.C. Um, next up, we will have our two of our 10-minute plays from the Gary Garrison National 10-Minute Play. Uh, award, uh, again directed by artists from Washington, D.C. First up is Jars by Jordan Morelli, directed by Holly Twyford, followed by Fishbowl by Eric Mike Skolsberger. Um, and Eric, uh, his play is directed by Ryan Maxwell.
the no hello. Saw each other just this morning. That was this morning. A ain't you want one last look at the place before you go? Surprised it's still standing. Palace of Helian Shine, weather is all sorts of things. She sees the leash. What you holding that for? Uh, it's Dodie's. I know. Why are you holding it? Let her go as we was loading up so I could meet you here. It's the only thing I can think of. Telling him would have been easier. Yeah? No, it wouldn't. Healy reaches for the box. Look what I got. She pulls out a marijuana joint and matchbook. Remember? We used to come here and get stupid with this stuff. Uh oh, the zap thing. Want to hit? No, I don't want to hit. Why not? You ain't driving. He'll smell it on me. Sorry, but that is the same stuff from back in 97. I don't want it touching me. That is sheer poison. <laughs> Be that way. She puts them back in the box. Why'd you make me come out here? You the one letting your dog run off. I didn't make you do nothing. Why am I here? Getting dark. I know. Gotta go before it gets that way. Fireflies be coming out Christ, soon. Healy. What? You make me come all the way out here, leaving him waiting for me to find the dog so we could catch fireflies? Some of the best times in my life was catching fireflies with you. Nothing but the sounds of us laughing and a choir of crickets. I ain't catching no fireflies. I've been practicing. Bet money I can get more than you this it's time. To finish our collection. These jars I'm going to get to a hundred. No, I said no. All right. Healy reaches for the jam box and presses play. Tom Petty's American Girl. <clears throat> what is going on with you? Nothing. Just want one last time before you go. One last time for what? Song, though. He ain't got a song. What are you doing? It doesn't matter so long as it's working. Look on your face as it is. No, I, I ain't that girl no more. She shuts the music off. I'm a married woman now. Only in God's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in God's eyes. And in Doyle's, and his mama's, and my daddy's. All of Greenville's eyes know me as Mrs. Sutton now. About time you knew that same. She opens the door. And Mr. and Mrs. Sutton are moving to Houston, Texas, and we are never coming back. So you can catch fireflies without me. Was last Tuesday something God's eyes saw, too? Well, was it? It was a mistake. That's so. That's what I am to you, huh? A mistake? You know, you're my best friend, you know that. Best friend or girlfriend? Which one? You and me have been friends a long time, Healy. We've done a lot of things together. We was just kids, just little girls, didn't know no better. The only one don't know no better is you. Thinking just because we in Arkansas, what we have is wrong, that our love is wrong? I don't love you. I love Doyle. He don't know you like I know you. He knows me enough. Not what you said last Tuesday. That was... That is a different kind of love. The forbidden kind? The embarrassing kind? Just different. How so? It's... Quick. Short. Don't last too long. Like, like, like a firefly. Burns bright like one, too. Why'd you marry him? Because he loves me. So do I. 
Don't please. I have to. Keely reaches into the box again. She pulls out an old piece of paper. Two red splotches are stained through. What do you still do with that? Here. Read it. I know what it says. I don't think you do. Not anymore. Sean Hutchins and Keely Martin can never and will never be apart from one another no matter what happens in life or death. Their souls are one and their bodies will know nothing but pain should either one be gone from other for too long. We mark this open so as to ensure we never break it. Marked in blood. Things have changed, Keely. Not everything. Not my love for you. And, and not what's going to happen to me if you leave. Those are just words. Don't mean you're going to get hurt me being in Texas. I will. Don't need this oath to tell me that neither can it. The, the only one knows me is you. Only soul in Greenville willing to get close enough. What I got to do, huh? Give me a big old jar and put you inside? Because I will. Keep you here with me always. My own special fire. Burning bright till forever. Let's make a new oath. I don't want to make a new oath. I do. Pass me one of them jars. See? Keely scoots to a row of jars and removes one. Open it up. It's got dead bugs in it. Better even. You got our knife? Keely reaches into the box and removes an old pocket knife. She hands it to Shine, who opens it. Let it be known from this day on, hinted forever, that I, Shine Sutton, will never ever forget my best friend. My first love. Keely Martin. No matter where I am or where I'll be, she will always have a part of my soul. She pricks her finger. And a piece of my heart. She holds her finger over the jar and drips blood into it. When done, she hands the knife and jar to Keely. Your turn. Please don't go. Keely. I don't want to know a life without you. You ain't gonna. John Sutton might be leaving, but. John Hutchins will always be yours. Now come on with me. <laughs> Let it be known that from now on into forever that I, Keely Martin, will always love and never forget Shine Sutton. She pricks her finger. We mark this oath in blood so as to ensure it's never broken. Those to ensure it's never broke. Keely drips her blood into the jar and seals it. So that's it now? Yeah, that's it.
you. Always ends. Shine heads down in exits, letting the door shut after her. Keely looks down at the jar. She places the jar back where she got it. <coughs> she looks at all of the jars and then the hanging sign. The sounds of crickets swell. Somewhere outside, a dog barks. Blackout and the play. to go in there without me. I can't stand it in there anyway. It'd be even worse if there were actually any people here. I do like that. Look, we are lucky the priest even showed okay, up. Okay, why don't you just stay out here then and come in when you're ready. Thank you. You know, this isn't easy for me either. I know you have extra baggage along. But do you think that I'm not feeling the exact same shit that you are feeling? But you have no idea what I'm feeling. Yes, I do. There isn't a second that goes by that I don't blame myself for what happened or think that our boy wouldn't be lying in there if I'd only done something. Our boy is in there because of his own actions. Oh, sure, that's the easy way to look at it. Well, how else would you look at it? You are such a chicken shit. Oh, you think so? <laughs> Because honestly, I can't even begin to think of a reason as to how you can just sit there feeling so blameless. We had just as much to do with this. He was our responsibility. He was a grown man. He was 18. He was a boy. He could have come to us. And why didn't he? Blame him. How can you blame him? Go inside. Look, I'll 
I'll be in there in a minute, and then we can get this over with. Don't worry. You are such a fucking coward. Right. You are, Mark. Yep, okay. You're a coward. Whatever. No, oh, okay, look at me. I can point fingers, too. And what can I say? You should be sticking up for him. How the fuck do you stick up for something like that? He's your son! Yeah, well, I'm sure that that is the easy way to look at that it. That is the only way to look at it. There is no way to forget, even if I try to. The media is constantly reminding us other parents can't even look at us. Every time I turn on the goddamn news or my computer, I am reminded. I am not even allowed to go back to work. No, they told me to take some time. What do you want to do, Mark? What's the right way to handle this situation? Just blame him? Call him a, a psycho? Like everyone else? Lunatic, faggot, asshole, terrorist. Is that what we should be doing? Or should we just try to remember the good parts of our son and celebrate that? To be honest, Tomorrow, someone might come in and, and, and destroy his tombstone. I am scared to death that people are going to come after me or you. I am terrified. But I am willing to take on whatever burden comes along with this because he was my son. And although I do not agree with the choices that he made in his life, he is still my son and nothing in this world can make me turn my back on him, especially now, when he needs us most. I wish I could, but I just can't. I wish I could, but it's just not that easy for me. It's not supposed to be easy. <laughs> yes, it should be. He was my son, too. I should be able to think the same things that you're thinking right now, but I'm not. Instead, I hate him, and I am so angry with him because he never came to us. Maybe he did. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he did. And we just didn't know it. I gave him the gun. It was mine. I didn't know he was depressed. I just thought he was going through a rough patch. So I wanted to give him something. I remember when my dad gave me my first gun and it, I don't know, it, it made me happy. It, it meant something to me. I thought that it would do the same thing for him, but then when I saw the news, I mean, 12 kids, my God. And I was praying that he wasn't one of them. And then I saw what he had done and I hated him. And I still do, I feel like he betrayed me. He was a good kid. He was never a bully. Yeah, he got pushed around quite a bit, but he was always the first one to forgive someone. He never held grudges. I guess he got that from you. No. <laughs> he got that from you. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Mark, I'm, I'm still mad at you for giving Cody away. Oh, would you let that go already? No. Look, and 
I didn't give him away. I just said that so that you wouldn't be mad. accidentally dropped him in the garbage disposal. What? Yep. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> For the rest of the week, I was terrified that whenever she dropped a spoon down there, his little head would pop out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. You made me tell him that Cody died. Well, he did die. <laughs> Gosh, he was such a good kid. He was. I really hate this suit. Then why do I still feel so angry? Maybe he isn't the one that you have to keep. Happy to stop. That certainly shows the power of how the 10 minute play form can, can really grip you. We'll have two more uh, in this evening's program. Next up with the Michael Kanan Play Playwriting Awards Showcase, uh, we have a selection from playwright and solo artist Cliff Cardinal, um, an excerpt from a play described as a First Nations kids who abuse solvents. Um, this play uh, that's going to be presented is called Huff. Without further ado. before and 
that's when he'd hear it, a gentle whisper through the plastic bag. The first time you hear something like that doesn't mean anything. You probably made it up. Maybe a hallucination brought on by your brain screaming out for oxygen. I'm 90% sure that's what you are. Hi, imaginary friends. The second time you hear it, the voice is familiar, like a TV show that's gone off the air. I think about yelling at myself and cursing my own self-pity, but I don't want to give myself the satisfaction. So anyway, that's how I got here. Really, there's a perfectly rational explanation for all of this. Hey, can you get this off of me? Seriously. No, seriously, this isn't a metaphor. If you don't take this off me, I'll stop it. See, for my people, trickster is a real thing. Ask anyone's kokum. You don't live to see 70 years old around here and not see someone acting a fool. But if you listen, you can hear the lessons. And through the generations we've heard the lessons so many times, we came up with a word for it. Trickster. That one drink too many before the drive home? Trickster. Questionable piece of ass you tapped on natural? <laughs> Trickster. <laughs> that the very story that brought you into the darkness is the only one that can lead you into the light? <laughs> Trickster. When you've got a plastic bag on your head, what you're doing is rebreathing the same breath until it chokes you. And the breath I'm breathing is a story that began a long, long time ago. In the 80s. <laughs> One day, a young warrior on the hunt met a beautiful girl. He'd known her since she was a child, but looked at her with new eyes. At a time when all the young warriors were meeting their future wives, Tracy was the most beautiful girl Michael had ever seen. She had the kind of beauty that tribes went to war for. A beauty that pulled the air right out of an Indian's lungs. <clears throat> With great respect and trepidation, Michael approached and requested permission to begin courting. Tracy, why are you so stuck up? <laughs> why you gotta be like that? <laughs> Is it so hard to just be happy? The girl had many suitors, but accepted the young warrior's request because but accepted the young warrior's request because, because trickster. Before long, the young warrior had acquired enough firewood for the winter and a lodge big enough for them both. When he was ready, he brought her there and asked her to marry him. With joy in her heart, the girl went to her mother to tell of the young warrior's proposal. Mama, I'm pregnant. <laughs> ah, shit. 
Here we go. It's cause you don't listen. And now here you are knocked up, up the stick, in a way. And I'll tell you something else about that man of yours for free, way he treats you. He's either dumb, stupid, or just ain't got no good sense. But mama, I love him. you don't listen. <laughs> and so the young warrior and the beautiful girl were wed. And for a time they were happy. No one knows how the young warrior drew Trickster's attention. Maybe one of those little curses we think we walk away from. Huh? Ever said I love you and weren't sure that you meant it? Ever stolen something and got away with it? Ever walked the streets at night and had nowhere to go? Trickster's waiting for you there. I don't have the antidote. I don't know how it stops, and I don't know how things change. But there is one thing we know attracts Trickster. Fear. And for all the strong, powerful ways the young warrior was, he was also a Soon the trickster preyed on him in his dreams. The young warrior turned cruel. He beat the girl and took away her hope. He became less a warrior and more a demon. The girl was trapped and so turned to the bottle. When her first son, Charles, was born, the midwife could smell the alcohol on the baby. The girl's mother, the baby's kokum, came to the young couple with medicine and in ceremony, showed the two the way out of the darkness. Oh, my, my squad, a hey, oh, oh, oh. The girl quit drinking, and the young warrior promised never to be so cruel again. Six years passed, and they had another son, and then another. But the trickster is patient, Soon the young warrior was chasing every hot girl on the res, totally unchecked. Soon the girl turned back to the bottle, and soon the young couple was back in the darkness where they began. When the young warrior abandoned the girl and her three children to the winter, the trickster was ready. days and some change, to be exact. Snow has come and gone, three seasons of bitter winds and oppressive heat. I'm fighting the urge to count the years of daylights and sunsets and cups of coffee as my friends the Brents so poetically did. <laughs> Many people have come and gone, some have graduated, others have priced out, I'll get to that momentarily. Many of the elderly and the too young have died, some violently, others softly, quietly in the night, wrapped in the arms of the man or woman they spent their lifetime with. But we're not there yet. That's the next part. This is only part two. It's strange how we push death away, how we only talk about it if someone has died, yet death is always here reminding us she is waiting. Especially in court town, she waits. Ah, sorry, I know I said we'll save death for later, and we will. I have the tendency to get ahead of myself. Felicia's always warning me against doing that. Anyway, what was I? Oh, yes, ah, uh, yes, uh, uh, much has changed in Court Town. Our population, for the most part, has stayed the same. We may have a thousand more folks or so, but there's a sort of white fight happening. In the 1960s, back when we had 1.8 million, the city was 70% white. 
28% black, and barely percent everything else. Three years ago, we were 10.6% white, 82.69% black, and more, still barely, but more percent everything else, to be exact. In those three years, those 525,600 minutes, so dear in daylight and sunsets and midnights and cups of coffee, sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> there was a shift, a slight shift. But that's where change begins, in the slightest of shifts. The number of blacks has fallen 5%, and the number of whites has risen 4%. You'll be on one block surrounded by boarded up brownstones and crack dealers, and then you turn the corner and all the houses have been renovated. Lawns, manicured, Dave Matthews, and Coldplay blasting from the houses. <laughs> Crown Fried is being turned into a, uh, a little vegan place. I like vegan food. I mean, don't get me wrong, God, or whatever science or deity or alien you believe in, made us carnivores for a reason. But I can dig vegan food. If white flight was then running to the suburbs, then running back must be white fight. Not sure what they're fighting for, but then again, not sure what they were flying from to begin with. Slowly as he speaks, members of the cast leave. Only folks we don't know as well remain. And I can't blame the hipsters newcomers. A lot of natives were on their side. Reverend Johnson, Atlas, even the Combs came back to join the fight to save Corktown, but they didn't understand what it meant, what they would be losing, the death in its rebirth. At this point, the fire has burnt out and only a few remain on stage trying to hold on to how the song, the music, the city once sounded. The curtain drops. Perhaps we move to a different stage. Once again, that was an excerpt from Corktown by Jeff Augustin. Um, next up, we have another 10 minute play for you in our celebration uh, entitled Occupy Hallmark by Cassie Sainuk from Leslie University, directed by Kelsey Mesa. Tis the season to be screwed. Fra la 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 la. Kiss her and then tell her she's got gonorrhea. Hmm? <laughs> Cupid's a fat homeless guy in diapers shooting HIV arrows. <laughs> hey, start spreading the love? Yeah, start spreading your shit. Tiffany's Blood Diamonds is more like Tiffany's African Babies Killers. Love is a fucking four-letter word. Happy Valentine's Day, sluts! Mark Yamas? <laughs> Promote sweatshop labor by a... Salty? Hey, no one's <laughs> called me that in... What are you doing here? And on the ground? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm protesting. I see. Protesting what, exactly? Oh, this. This whole thing. And, uh, and that. The Hallmark store? Yeah, yeah, the whole greeting card industry. Ah. Uh, you and, uh... Jose Cuervo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he keeps me on task. You want some? No, thank you. Putting up a strong fight? Well, we haven't moved since, like, noon, so I think that we've been pretty successful. Nobody's tried to go in there for the last two hours, so... Because of you and your stronghold? Of course. Your occupation of this curb? Something like that, yeah. 
While you were sitting here occupied, did you notice the shopkeeper leave? Lock up and head home to his happy family? The store's closed. Actually, yes. You know, he even told me to go fuck myself in Pakistani or Hindu or some shit like that while he was locking up. <laughs> then what good is your protesting going to do? No one's coming to buy cards again until tomorrow morning. 9 a.m.? Are you going to wait here until 9 a.m.? Yes. It's cold out. Mm, I'm well aware of that fact. You'll freeze. Why do you care? Because I'm your friend. Yeah, more like Kathy's friend. We haven't spoken since college, since you guys started. And besides, I knew you first. I've known you forever, so... Look, how about I help you up when we get something no. greasy like cheesy fries? Cinderella's has, has curly fries. I know you love curly fries. No, huh? Mr. Cuervo and I are doing fine. We're doing just fine. You don't look like you. No, you I said I'm doing fine right now. Right now, I am protesting greeting cards and nothing else. I'm especially not going to, what, promote some sort of cutesy diner with red shiny booth seats and old-timey milkshakes? Hey, nostalgia eateries are just okay, as I'm bad right. as greeting card companies. Hey, 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 look, I, I, I've been very successful thus far, hmm? Yeah, so moving right now would just be backpedaling at this point. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I have prevented at least like a billion people from walking into that death trap that they call a store, yeah? Girlfriends, boyfriends, husbands, wives, gay husbands. I think they're just called husbands. Gay wives. Just called wives. Yeah. I even stopped some old lady with a little kid, like probably her grandkid or something, from making the biggest mistake of his third grade life. And what's that? You know, those kids, those kids, the, the glasses, and you know, the occasional nosebleed. And the stupid heart-shaped cards from more than one braided-haired, pixie-ponytailed girl. And then, you know, he passes them out like some sort of player. And none of those girls are going to give a my little pony shit about you. So stop trying to spread your eggs in all the baskets because these curls will crack all of your eggs. And then all you're going to be left with is this pool of yolky egg mess. And it is never going to change. <sighs> Are you done now? I broke through to those people. I did. I let them know that there is nothing in that store that'll change a thing about whomever says they love them. I, I, I took a, I, okay, I took a stand. <laughs> and did that get you anywhere? Yes. No, but they understood. They understand. Those cards you gave out as a kid weren't stupid. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were. You gave one to me in the second grade. I did? Yeah, see? You don't even remember. Oh, no, no, I mean, I did, so, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you were my first Valentine. Is that weird? Why would it be weird? Uh, I don't know, just mean because of Kathy or... There are many other reasons why things got weird with Kathy. Like what? Nothing. Girl stuff. I don't think you have to worry about that. I know I don't. Because I'm taken. Uh, no, no, because she left me. Oh, come on. Now, don't pretend like you didn't know. I mean, you know, like, for sure. But you're out here pretty down on yourself, pretty down on the love things. When did she... Last night. Oh, shit, Moose, I'm She sorry. ended it. She ended... Everything. She said, she said, I can't love a guy who won't buy me cards and candy. No, she said... But it wasn't even Valentine's Day yet. Yeah, well, she may have asked me if I was getting her something, and I may have laughed in her face and said no. <laughs> oh. Well... Moose... But I mean, after three years, three years is a long time, and she just... Three... Fucking years. Hey, you know, I made her, I made her a special, personalized playlist slideshow, yeah? I once recorded myself singing our song. One time, one time I took all of this stuff out of her junk drawer, you know, like just paper clips and, and ticket stubs and a little Cracker Jack prize, and I made like this coolest diorama of our first date together. Pretty awesome. I know, I know, right? But she wanted cards. Stupid.
stupid communist capitalist cards in heart-shaped chocolate boxes. And you never bought her one, a card? Not even like a happy birthday or anniversary or Merry Christmas. No, never nothing. Well, some girls like that sort of stuff. Do you? No, but I'm not that type of girl. <laughs> yeah, they all say that. No, they all say that. <laughs> I think those cards are trite. Why should anyone have to sum up how they feel to anyone on a mass-produced piece of folded paper? You are. You're totally reading my mind. And those teddy bear stuffed animals with hugging hearts. Oh, I know! They look like something you win at a carnival, like those Winnie the Pooh dolls, like they somehow look demonic. Yes! Yes! And those chocolates with the red cherry mush inside totally taste like Robitussin. Oh, my Jesus, please. Like, but... <laughs> now, how come you never told me that you felt this way about this stuff? What opportunity would I have had? Well, none better than now, I guess. Look, you're going to be fine. Yeah. She broke up with you for the stupidest reason in the world. Does she even know you? You do your own thing. Yeah, 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 I do. On the eve of Valentine's Day, you don't <coughs> sulk in your room. Oh, well, I sulk on the street. Sure. It's not what I was going to say. Sure. You sulk it? Yeah, I'm just... How is that? Is it Carlos? Uh, it's Gustavo. Oh. Very romantic. Candlelit dinner. Got me these? Roses. Very nice. <laughs> hate roses. No, I, I, I hate roses. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? And, and yet, he didn't walk you home. He didn't take you to your door. He didn't kiss you on the lips. All of those things. He wanted to. I thanked him, but I told him I needed to walk. Some me time. Oh, I hear you. He got me a card. Oh. <laughs> Chocolates. He said he loved me. That's that's great. That's, wow. Uh, very cool. <laughs> Muscle talk. Um, <laughs> did you did you say it back? Um, Saltzman, join the fold. Oh, no, 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 but try something more like, um, um, uh, Hallmark eats babies for breakfast and then uses baby blood for eight. Something like that. <laughs> that we have mature language in tonight's program. <laughs> well, our final 10-minute play um, is by Wendy Ewan, titled My First Love, Wendy Comes to Us from Glendale Community College. And uh, the play is directed by Elizabeth Kitsos Kang. First love, 
by Wendy Buren. Gabby, a mother and wife in her 30s. Cowboy, a rugged, long-willed man. <laughs> Cow, Gabby's caring husband. <laughs> a large, pristine, ensuite bathroom in Gabby and Cow's home, morning. Cowboy leans against an invisible door, playing with a lighter. He whistles, my cheating heart. <laughs> Gabby enters holding a black dress on a hanger. She slumps against Cal's back and wipes her eyes. Cal enters with a coffee cup, dressed in a black suit. How you doing, babe? Oh. Uh, brought you some energy juice. Oh, coffee. Thanks, Cal. I've got to get myself together. Can you deal with the kids a little while longer? Roger that. Mm. Oh, by the way, uh, there was another, let's call it, artistic expression left on the bathroom rug this morning, but we, we, we've got the situation under control. Oh, good lord! And uh, there might have been a, a minor scissor accident. Oh, God, not again! We should start locking up those scissors at night. I brushed over the bald spot, so he looks fine now. And, <laughs> and they've had breakfast. They had breakfast. The chocolate chip pancakes, just like your mom made's. Thanks, babe. That's perfect. You're a good husband. What? Check out this kind of help every day. Yeah, well, I wish I'd have to work 60 hours a week. Okay, I didn't mean anything by that, Jesus. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's just I'm not sure what you want from me. If you want to talk, we can I'm talk. I'm fine. I... Let's not fight. I've got to get ready. I'll rally the troops. 15-minute mm. warning? Sounds good. No hurry. Cal exits. Gabby turns around and enters the bathroom where she runs into Cowboy. It's you. I got this tickly feeling that you might need me. <laughs> I've missed you. <laughs> well, I'm missing you too, darling. It's been so long. It sure has. How long you reckon? Well, T is going on 14, so it's been about 15 years. I had to stop. You know, the pregnancy, it wouldn't have been right. I had to say goodbye. No hard feelings, darling. Fifteen years is a long haul. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but it ain't forever. No, but it's supposed to be. Forever, I mean. You aged me. If we'd stayed together, it'd be worse. You would have ruined me. Just like... You still glow. Mm. Sorry about your mom. I'm a mother now, too. I have to think of them. I have to think of him, Cal. Do you and Cal have that spark like we used to? Mm. We've been married a long time. But we're. Gabby, coming down! You have to go. Don't you get it? They're waiting for me. They depend on me. You used to make me feel so dirty. I had to brush my teeth four times a day to get rid of the taste of you. Well, sure, they depend on you, but who takes care of you? Huh? Let me. Okay in there? They're chomping at the bed. Almost ready. They won't start the funeral without us. Gabby, I'm sorry about before. I mean, I know this is a hard day for you. Maybe the hardest day Just give me ten more minutes! I'll get everyone loaded up. <laughs> Cal exits. Gabby quickly undresses. I have worked hard to give you up. In the beginning, every day was a struggle. I thought about you all the time. The evenings were the hardest. Gabby's now in black underclothes. She lets her hair down. Mm. Cowboy eyes her appreciatively. <sighs> that seems just about right. <laughs> when I was trying to paint, it just wasn't the same without you around. You were my muse. Those long nights without end, the scent of oils, turpentine. I miss it. Not a 
that I even have time to work anymore, or the brain space. My days are not my own with all the soccer, karate, piano lessons, those hideous mommy and me classes, making lunches, making valentines. Huh. By nighttime, all I can think about is sleep. Now the only painting I do is finger paint. Not that I'm bitter. <laughs> well, I guess that's just the way of the world, sweetie. Can't have it all, I reckon. You know I can help. You're toxic. Let me help you. Yeah. <laughs> What's the matter? Huh? Just once ain't gonna kill you. No. I'll be right back in the saddle, addicted to you. It's selfish. Cal has always hated you, you know? Didn't find you the least. Charming, no offense. Untake, heard it all before. Gabby puts on her dress, then begins applying makeup in the mirror. Was I special? At least, tell me I'm special. Of course you were, honey bun, of course you were. <laughs> How? I mean, what made me special? Well, you needed me more than most. <laughs> You all smell so good. I had to hide you from my parents. <laughs> oh, you were awful fun. <laughs> and adventurous. Remember that summer at the dude ranch? I still love the smell of hay. Takes me right back. Leaning back with you in the barn, and those hay bales scratching my back. Your scent mingling with that raw nature smell. Misty snorting and stomping right there next to us. Such chirping, a good old horse. The chirping of crickets in the hot summer air. Darkness all lit up by fireflies, like little flying matches. Carrying our sparks through the air. Our little secret. <laughs> Could be that way again. We were good together, girl. You want me. I want you. You want to own me. When you were around, I lost all self-control. Gabby starts brushing her hair. Cowboy takes the brush and brushes for her. Such good times. Alaska, the fishing boat, all those big birds, <laughs> man. And then there was little old you. They were harmless, a little rough around the edges. My own personal herd of big brothers. A couple of times I went to town, into the bar, it was like having a whole security <coughs> detail around me. As if I were Marilyn Monroe or something. <laughs> they made me feel beautiful. Even though we still stank to high heaven. They wouldn't let anyone with facial hair near me. <laughs> Those were good times. You were. You are beautiful. Mm. I'm so wild out there. That endless water, those big fluffy clouds, like God was right there with us, blowing smoke rings, that stuff in the sky, the beer, the whiskey, that old AM radio. Who knew I liked country music? Every time I hear Cheating Heart, it reminds me of that amazing, surreal, fucked up summer on the water. It's a wonder we ever caught anything. projected over and over on that movie screen of the sky, birth and death. Birth and death. I'm so completely free. Time didn't matter. I thought I would be young forever. I was a different person then. She's still in there. I see her. Took to me like white on rice. A flies on shit. Oh. <laughs> they say you're always chasing that same glorious feeling of the first time. But you never can recapture it. it sure is fun trying. Gabby! Gabby, I'm getting worried about you. We really need to go. Coming! 
flicker briefly go out, a spark of a lighter, then lights up. Daddy, you're smoking? Some thought they would leave for New York, Austin, San Fran once they were up and running, but they never did. It became their home. People underestimate the meaning of home. But not everyone embraced it. As he speaks, he pulls from the crate a hoodie, slips it on, and zips it up. I didn't. He pulls out a can of gasoline and a lighter. I fought against it. Why? Because of the ruins, the history. I wanted to keep it as it was. It was already the most incredible thing I had ever seen. In all its dysfunction, its violence, its ugliness, it was perfect. It was beauty. It was Corktown. He puts the hood over his head. He is the figure from earlier, the vandal. He sprays the gasoline on the back wall with the murals. So, when the moon was high, the stars bright, and ozone thin, when only graveyard ship workers, foreign lovers, and uncared for children were still awake. He strikes the match and sets the back wall on fire. A bitter smoke filled the air, and ash fell like snow. Ash begins to fall. The song begins to shift. It becomes haunting. There's something unnatural underneath it. The entire cast is now in the space facing the audience. But instead of becoming the symbol of great protest for our city, it became the final nail in the coffin. People came together to save Corktown from hate and violence. I wasn't hateful. Maybe a little violent against this building, against Clark. The Clark incident was a, was a true accident. I just wanted to scare him, but I lost control. Didn't realize how strong I was or how anger has a way of poisoning the best of intentions. The cops never found me, but the patrolling grew. As did the cement, the brick, and stone, every day new buildings rose taller than the old ones, and slowly, inevitably, folks were pushed out. A hooded figure enters. But as much as things change... Lights rise on the back wall. It is covered with anti-hipster graffiti. Many things stay the same. For now. Before we end our evening, I'd like to just acknowledge our playwrights. If you're in the audience, please stand. Yes, they do walk among you. Thank you. And I have to give another thank you to all of our artists, our, our directors, our actors who presented tonight, uh, giving of their time and their generosity. Please thank them with me. This concludes our presentation. Be well. Thank you for supporting new work. And a very heartfelt good night.